Good evening, peoples. I'm Pastor Leia, and this is my friend, Ginger Snap. So welcome back to our living room for our Tuesday night Bible study series. Uh, so for a bit now, we've been looking at some of the books that aren't either in the Bible at all or aren't in our Protestant Bibles, yes, uh, many of which have some very interesting stories, uh, some of which that kind of ended up still being in our understanding of Bible stories, uh, such as today's stories. Our, I, I, I can almost guarantee, excuse you, we don't buy jewelry. I can almost guarantee you that you have um, heard at least one or two of the themes in tonight's story. So uh, to recap, last week we were uh, looking at the story of uh, Mary uh, her, herself, uh, pre-Jesus. Uh, so Mary is the daughter of Anne and Joachim, according to some of the Gospels that didn't make it in. Uh, so she was immaculately conceived without sin. So that is the conception of Mary being born without sin. And the immaculate conception is not the virgin birth, which is kind of a trivial thing to get annoyed about, but it annoys me when these things are used interchangeably. Anyway, um, so uh, Mary was given to the temple when she was a toddler um, in gratitude for the uh, um, unlikely miraculous birth uh, of Mary, uh, since Anne and Joachim were both older. So she grew up to be beautiful and kind and wise and pious and like basically perfect. And uh, an angel showed up literally every day to give her food, which is astonishing. So uh, tonight's readings, we have a few more from the Gospel of James from the second or third century that we read some of last week. Uh, again, from the uh, Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, which was written somewhere between the seventh and ninth centuries, uh, maybe added to over a couple generations. Uh, Pseudo-Matthew means in the tradition of Matthew, not uh, somebody claiming to be Matthew, but not actually, because plagiarism is a, is a modern concept. Anyway, um, and uh, so tonight we're also going to have some readings from the history of Joseph the Carpenter from the fifth century, which is a very interesting book. It's uh, written from the perspective of Jesus, and uh, he's telling this uh, long, quite beautiful, elaborate story about Joseph uh, to his friends on the Mount of Olives. So um, there's um, a lot of overlap uh, with this story with the, the three readings, um, but I'm kind of picking and choosing the bits that are at the most like concise. Uh, so, uh, we're, so we'll start off with uh, from the Gospel of James. And when Mary became 12 years old, there was a council of the priests saying, look, Mary has been in the temple of the Lord 12 years. What should we do about her so that she won't pollute the sanctuary of the Lord our God? And they said to the chief priest, you stand at the altar of the Lord. Go in and pray about her. And if the Lord God reveals anything to you, we'll do it. And the chief priest went in, taking the robe with 12 bells into the Holy of Holies and prayed about her. And look, an angel of the Lord stood nearby saying, Zechariah, Zechariah, go out and assemble the widowers of the people and let them each bear a staff. And whomever the Lord God points out with a sign, she'll be his wife. And the heralds went down through the whole surrounding area of Judea and sounded the trumpet of the Lord, and look, all the men rushed in. So that is uh, James' version in uh, Pseudo-Matthew. She's 14, not 12. Uh, and also in Pseudo-Matthew, which was clearly written for a, a different and less Jewish audience, uh, she leaves the temple because it's the custom that um, young women raised in the temple leave at 14 to get married. Uh, whereas in James, she's being sent away at 12 uh, before she can get her first period because that would uh, defile the, the temple because... Jewish laws and purity, and if you have your, your period, you're kind of like needing to be away from the, the temple and people for a bit. It's, it's complicated. Uh, so um, now from the history of Joseph the Carpenter, as recounted by Jesus, so it's first person from Jesus. There was a man whose name was Joseph, sprung from a family of Bethlehem, a town of Judah, and the city of King David. This same man, being well furnished with wisdom and learning, was made a priest in the temple of the Lord. He was, besides, skillful in his trade, which was that of a carpenter, and after the manner of all men, he married a wife. Moreover, he begot for himself, I love the, the Bible verb, begot. <laughs> it's weird how we don't usually use it these days. Uh, he begot for himself sons and daughters, four sons, namely, and two daughters. Now these are their names, Judas, Justice, James, and Simon. The names of the two daughters were Asia and Lydia. 
At length, the wife of righteous Joseph, a woman intent on the divine glory and all her works, departed this life. But Joseph, that righteous man, my father after the flesh, and the spouse of my mother Mary, went away with his sons to his trade, practicing the art of a carpenter. So anyway, the priests are looking for a husband for Mary, and so they send for all the men without wives or all the men who are widowers, depending on the, the story, um, from among the tribe of Judah. So a bunch of guys show up. Uh, one of them, there's only 12 men specifically, and the other two just have like a, a bunch of, not really the point. So that's our introduction to Joseph. So again, from James, and when they had all gathered, they went to the priest with their staffs. And having taken all their staffs, uh, the priest went into the temple and prayed. And when he had finished the prayer, he took the staffs, went out, and gave them back. But there wasn't a sign among them. And Joseph took his staff last, but look, a dove went from the staff and flew upon Joseph's head. You should be excited about that part. There's a bird on somebody's head. You just want to be petted. <laughs> and the priest said to Joseph, you have been chosen to welcome the Virgin of the Lord into your own care. So now from uh, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, Then all the people congratulated the old man, saying, Joseph, Thou hast been made blessed in thine own age, O Father Joseph, seeing that God hath shown thee to be fit to receive Mary. And the priests, having said to him, Take her, because of all the tribe of Judah, thou alone hast been chosen by God. Joseph began bashfully to address them, saying, I am an old man and have children. Why do you hand over to me this infant who is younger than my grandsons? <laughs> Joseph is uh, kind of uh, taking a bit of an attitude with the priest here. He refers to Mary as an infant who is younger than my grandsons, which, I mean, to be fair, that would kind of be an odd uh, arranged marriage from either of their perspectives, probably. <laughs> kind of love that. Anyway, so uh, Joseph is uh, nevertheless convinced to take Mary in, uh, despite his initial concerns, and uh, he definitely has some concerns in uh, all, all the versions of the story. So now from James, uh, Joseph welcomed her into his care and said to her, Mary, I've taken you from the temple of the Lord, and now I bring you to my house. I'm going away to build houses, but I'll come back to you. The Lord will protect you. Now some more from the history of Joseph the carpenter. Uh, Righteous Joseph therefore received my mother and led her away to his own house. And Mary found James the less in his father's house, broken hearted and sad on account of the loss of his mother, and she brought him up. James the less is being like James is named after somebody named James, so instead of like James Jr. or James the second or third, he's James the less. Uh, hence, Mary was called the mother of James because she cared for this uh, young man who was grieving the loss of his mother. Uh, thereafter, Joseph left her at home and went away to the shop where he wrought at his trade of a carpenter. And after the Holy Virgin had spent two years in his house, her age was exactly 14 years, including the time at which he received her. Uh, so the Annunciation happens. Uh, you know, an angel comes to Mary and says, Hey, so um, you're pregnant now uh, with God's child. You're welcome. Uh, oh, also, don't, don't, don't be afraid, because I'm an angel, probably freaking you out right now. And Mary's like, uh, I am what now? And the angel's like, yeah, I get, you're pregnant. And Mary's like, okay. Anyway, that, that, that's my telling of the story. So uh, the Annunciation happens. So now from uh, Pseudo Matthew, while these things were doing, Joseph was occupied with his work, house building, in the districts by the seashore, for he was a carpenter. And after nine months, he came back to his house and found Mary pregnant. Wherefore, being in the utmost distress, he, crum he trembled and cried out, saying, O Lord God, receive my spirit, for it is better for me to die than to live any longer. I really love how, like, sassy and melodramatic Joseph is in this story. It, it really, it, it's great for the narrative. Uh, for it is better for me to die than to live any longer. And the young women who were with Mary said to him, Joseph... What art thou saying? We know that no man has touched her. We can testify that she is still a virgin and untouched. We have watched over her always as she continued with us in prayer. Daily do the angels of God speak with her. Daily does she receive food from the hand of the Lord. We know not how it is possible that there can be any sin in her. But 
If thou wishest us to tell thee what we suspect, nobody but the angel of the Lord has made her pregnant. Then said Joseph, Why do you mislead me to believe that an angel of the Lord has made her pregnant? But it, it is possible that someone has pretended to be an angel of the Lord and has beguiled her. And thus speaking, he wept and said, what am I to do? Which uh, that kind of seems like a pretty reasonable conclusion that it seems a lot more likely that someone would pretend to be an angel of the Lord in order to have sex with someone rather than the likelihood of an angel of the Lord showing up and uh, bam, Mary is pregnant. So, I mean, Joseph is not, he's, he's not a dumb man. Anyway, uh, so an angel comes to Joseph and eventually he accepts that yes, Mary is pregnant by very unusual divine means and not because she had an affair. Uh, so anyway, um, this so kind of deviating slightly. Uh, so the, the six children of uh, Joseph, Judas, Justice, James, Simon, Asia, and Lydia. Uh, so the, the four brothers are named within the canonical gospels. The sisters are not, uh, because why would women need to be named? Um, uh, so the word in, in Greek for brother, Adelphos, literally means of the same womb. Uh, but it could refer to either a biological brother or another member of one's religious community. Um, the the canon canonical gospels, of course, are written in Greek, so that could easily be read either way. Uh, clearly, um, Jesus and the children of Joseph would be raised in the same religious community, so it could be used that way. Uh, the word for sister is the same. It can either mean like literally a biological sibling or another member of your religious community. So, uh, but meanwhile, Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, doesn't have separate words for brother and cousin. Um, and so there, there's a lot of interesting, and I'm, I'm not a linguist, uh, but I, I, I have read that there are some interesting uh, spots throughout the Gospels where uh, Jesus says something like grammatically that would make more sense in Aramaic than in Greek. So it's like kind of a little bit lost in translation, which is really interesting. So th this could be something like that, that um, in the Aramaic, you, you use the word for brother, but means something else, but then in Greek, it means anyway. Um, I, I think my, my go-to example is that in English, we might say that somebody is feeling blue, which means that they are feeling sad. But if in another language you said, hey, somebody is feeling blue, you would be looked at in confusion. It's like, you, this person is a smurf, what? Because blue in, in that language might not have the same sense of sad. Anyway, so uh, we have three options uh, for Judas, Justice, James, Simon, Asia, and Lydia. So option one, they are the children of Joseph and his late wife, and therefore Jesus's step-siblings. Option two, they are the children of one of Joseph's siblings. Uh, Mary was an only child, and therefore they are Jesus's cousins, but they're raised together in kind of a, a close family situation. Um, and then option three, um, these other six children are the biological children of Mary and Joseph who were born after Jesus and therefore Jesus's half siblings. Um, any, any one of these um, options is perfectly valid reading uh, from any of the texts. Uh, so, let's see, yes. So either of the first two options, um, the, the step-siblings or, or the cousins, um, allow for the perpetual virginity of Mary, which is very important in Catholic theology, but usually not a part of Protestant beliefs. Uh, and so I guess we ask the question, could the same womb that carried the literal Son of God also carry fully human children? Uh, how does a toddler god play with regular human children? Uh, we, we uh, a couple weeks ago, went into an exploration of that in the uh, infancy Gospel of Thomas, that um, toddler god has powers and accidentally kills some regular human friends and then brings them back to life, which is such, such a great story. This is a really hard question to answer. Um, so anyway, the, the perpetual virginity idea first shows up in the second century. Uh, it becomes official doctrine at the Council of Ephesus in 431, uh, and then some later uh, councils and uh, big writings and things uh, continue to affirm this uh, and like have some uh, titles for Mary because of this and like uh, kind of emphasize uh, different details. 
Uh, so anyway, back to the history of Joseph the Carpenter, since there is no answer to uh, whether these uh, six siblings are Jesus's step-siblings, cousins, or half-siblings. Uh, so recounting Joseph's death, Jesus reveals that Joseph knew he was going to die soon because an angel came down and told him personally, which is a very thoughtful thing for an angel of the Lord to do. Uh, so Joseph goes to the temple and prays a long prayer, concluding with, O Lord and my God, I beseech thee, be present to me in thy compassion, and enlighten my path that I may come to thee. For thou art a fountain of overflowing with all good things, and with glory forevermore. Which is a rather lovely prayer. Um, for, uh, okay, so, um, then from, from a history of uh, Joseph Carpenter, uh, for this disease was very heavy upon Joseph, and he had never been ill as he now was from the day of his birth. And thus, assuredly, it pleased Christ to order the destiny of righteous Joseph. So Joseph, having never, literally never been sick in his entire life, also uh, is kind of a, a nice parallel to Mary growing up and basically being perfect, um, that like both of these people who raised Jesus have exceptional lives um, in and of themselves. Uh, so Joseph lived 40 years unmarried. Thereafter, his wife remained under his care 49 years and then died. And a year after her death, my mother, the Blessed Mary, was entrusted to him by the priests, that he should keep her until the time of her marriage. She spent two years in his house, and in the third year of her stay with Joseph, in the fifteenth year of her age, she brought me forth on earth by a mystery which no creature can penetrate or understand except myself and my Father and the Holy Spirit, constituting one essence with myself. Who boy is Jesus right there? <laughs> No one but him can understand how we came to be. Understatement. I, I really like that line. It, it, it's kind of great. Uh, so, uh, the uh, Jesus continues, The whole age of my father, therefore, that righteous old man, was 111 years, my father in heaven having so decreed. So, um, to do that math for you, Joseph married for the first time at the age of 40, which uh, coincidentally is the age of Joachim when Mary was born, but 40 is just like a number that the Bible tends to like and, and return to. Uh, so then Joseph was married to his first wife for 49 years, which is rather impressively long marriage. Uh, and then she died when he was 89, and we don't know how old she was. Uh, so they had six children together. Uh, in in the, the history of Joseph the Carpenter. So then, mathing again, Joseph was 90 years old when Mary showed up. 90! That is like the age of my grandfather. Uh, so Joseph was 92 when Jesus was born. And then Joseph died at the quite incredible age of 111, a number also known as 11 if you're the Tolkien nerds. Um, I, I'm always sitting in front of my shelf of fantasy books. So anyway, um, 11 to 1. Uh, so uh, then uh, Jesus, when Joseph died, was 19. So uh, some more from the history of Joseph the Carpenter. Um, Jesus and Joseph have one final conversation before his death. So Jesus says, And I, going in beside him, found his soul exceedingly troubled, for he was placed in great perplexity. And I said to him, Hail, my father Joseph, thou righteous man, how is it with thee? And he answered me, All hail, my well-beloved son. I, I really love that because uh, it, it echoes um, other scenes throughout the canonical Gospels where uh, God's voice comes down through the heavens and says that Jesus is beloved child. Uh, you are my beloved child, or this is my beloved child. And so here in, in this story, uh, which is written later, for Joseph to also describe Jesus as his well-beloved son, is it, it's really quite beautiful. And I, I really like that literary touch. Um, again, this is a really great story, the history of Joseph the Carpenter. It just isn't in our Bible, as it was written later. Um, beloved son. So indeed, the agony and fear of death have already environed me, but as soon as I heard thy voice, my soul was at rest. O oh, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus my Savior, Jesus the deliverer of my soul, Jesus my protector. 
so beautiful that Joseph can simultaneously love Joseph, love Jesus as a son, but also love him as a savior. And that's, that's really lovely. Uh, and just like this conversation really hits both the human and the divine natures of Jesus in his uh, wonderfully complex relationship with his stepfather. So then um, Jesus goes on to describe Mary's actions upon the death of her husband of 21 years, which, uh, I mean, 21 years is not 49 years, but still a pretty long marriage. Uh, so Jesus uh, goes on to refer to her as his undefiled mother and his virgin mother and the pure virgin. So uh, virginity is a social construct and, and having sex does not make a person defiled or impure, but, but the perpetual virginity of Mary is really important to a lot of people. So like, I'm, I'm trying not to project 21st century feminism here, uh, probably not fully succeeding, uh, sorry. Um, so personally, I am a bit neutral on whether or not Mary ever had sex or had other uh, biological children, but there are like a lot of details from within Jesus's life um, for people to focus on. And I don't think it's for me to say what the most important details are. I'm sure that I focus on aspects of theology, the Bible, Jesus's sayings, etc., that other people don't and vice versa. There's like a lot going on there. So um, anyway, if people believe that Jesus's mother was a virgin her entire life, because how could any mere human touch her intimately after she'd born the literal son of God, I, that, that's fine by me. Because balancing the dual human and divine natures of Jesus is basically impossible. Jesus himself even says in the history of Joseph the Carpenter that no one is capable of understanding uh, his conception except for like him and God and the Holy Spirit. Um, and anyway, uh, we're probably, we didn't have it figured out 2,000 years ago. We haven't figured it out now. And 2,000 years ago, we probably still won't have figured it out because Jesus is big and beyond our understanding in, in many ways. Anyway, so um, Mary's perpetual virginity leans more towards uh, Jesus's divine nature. Um, and it's, it's really hard to see both of these natures at the same time. So we tend to focus on one or the other, um, which and that, can, that can like switch throughout um, stories um, or, or hymns even, um, but it, it, it's, it's complicated. So anyway, so um, Jesus talks about seeing death, uh, like capital D, the figure of death and death's army, all of whom breathe fire. By the way, I think that is an important detail to relay, that death and death's army are breathing fire. Uh, so they're approaching and also the archangels Michael and Gabriel show up and they take the soul of Jesus and they wrapped it in a shining wrapper. I'm not entirely sure what that means or what that would look like, but I think it's really lovely. You know, souls being wrapped up in something sparkly, I think is, is nice. Anyway, so um, when Joseph's other either children or nibblings, depending, uh, nephews or nieces, nibblings, uh, depending on which option you're going with. So anyway, when they, when they learn about their father's death, Jesus tells them, Assuredly, the death of your father is not death, but life everlasting. For he has been freed from the troubles of this life and has passed to perpetual and everlasting rest. So Jesus just really, really deeply grieves the death of Joseph, and he promises that his physical body will never decay. So there's this big funeral, and people say nice things. Um, Joseph is taken to be buried in a cave, and Jesus just continues to embrace his body and cry over him and say how much he loves him, and he asks that a festival be held every year to commemorate him. Uh, I want to say that the Feast of St. Joseph is in, like, early spring. There was a big celebration of it at my college every year, and I should probably know when it was. But we, I, I am not Catholic, so I don't usually celebrate Saints' Feast Days. Anyway, um, 
So this um, history of Joseph the Carpenter was written a bit later and kind of um, retroactively inserts some things into the story that uh, explain current practices, like the tradition of having an annual festival for St. Joseph. And the idea of Mary's perpetual virginity is like explicitly sp spelled out in this story, whereas it's not in the earlier Gospels, because by the time this story was written, that was beginning to be a very important thing that was uh, making its way into the stories that we tell. Uh, we've had a long time to be telling stories of Jesus, and a lot of these stories were um, passed on uh, by word of mouth rather than being written down first. Um, and so things kind of gradually get added into the story or left out or where details are um, changed or uh, elaborated upon. Anyway, so um, yeah, the, the idea of Joseph being an old man who has children from a previous marriage is probably the simplest way of explaining where those other six kids came from. Um, obviously, that's the explanation in this particular story. Uh, it can also easily be read in the four Gospels that we do have. Um, but uh, again, they could just as well be Jesus's cousins, or they could be biological half-siblings, the children of Mary. I any of these three interpretations are entirely valid. Uh, and there's there's been much much debate about them over the years. Anyway, point being, uh, so the idea of Joseph being a uh, much older man uh, shows up a lot still in art and in depictions of uh, the nativity, etc. When I was in high school, uh, one year during Advent, I uh, sang a version of the Magnificat from the perspective of Mary, and my, my soul magnifies the Lord. And uh, then the next week I did a duet with uh, Joseph um, about trusting in God even when the way isn't clear. Uh, and then I did this really gorgeous uh, duet, it's such a beautiful piece of music, uh, with Elizabeth about uh, finding each other and uh, supporting each other in the midst of strange, unusual, complicated pregnancies. Uh, anyway, so um, again, I was in high school. I think I was a freshman. Why is there cat fur on my lipstick ginger snap? Do you have an explanation for this? Um, and so my husband, Joseph, was a like, middle-aged man uh, who I <laughs> later introduced to a person I was dating as my husband, <laughs> which probably no one thought was as funny as I did because I have a strange sense of humor. Anyway, um, but so Joseph being an older man is not in our gospels, but we still have kind of let that story carry on. So in art, um, Joseph is often a much older man. He might have the uh, cane with the bird on it. Uh, sometimes Mary is painted in front of a closed door and Joseph in front of an open door because Mary was a virgin and Joseph was not because he was previously married and had all these kids, which is an interesting touch. Uh, yeah, again, not so much in um, Protestant Christmas stories or images. Um, Joseph is more likely to be like in his 20s or 30s and not 90. Um, but th this idea still does uh, carry on in the, the popular uh, understanding of where Jesus comes from. So anyway, I, I just think that these stories are so interesting, whether or not they made it into the canonical gospels, and just really reflects how hard we've been trying to figure out Jesus for 2000 years. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily think that some of these early conclusions are quite hitting the mark, but who, who's to say? And I, I just love that we've been working so hard to figure out Jesus for 2,000 years because he is important. Anyway, so uh, since it is Advent, I wanted to bring back our Wednesday evening prayer services. So uh, you can join me tomorrow at 8. I'll be back in my craft room. Uh, Doris and I will be recording some music afternoons. So there will be lots of singing throughout uh, Advent and, and Christmas and Epiphany. I've got uh, some really beautiful art that we can uh, reflect on um, and uh, poetry. And so that should be nice. I'm working on putting those together. Uh, so join us uh, for Wednesday evening prayer throughout uh, December and uh, early January. Uh, you can also join us over Zoom for our fellowship time at 5 on Thursdays. Did I already say Thursday? I think I did. Anyway, uh, that, that, that is ongoing. And of course, on Sundays, you can join us either in person at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary or online uh, more around 10, 15. Uh, we'll continue to have uh, special music throughout Advent and lots of candles. And uh, Advent is just a really lovely season with some, anyway, 
lovely, lovely things. Uh, also, I just kind of like the color purple, so that, that helps, but also the candles and the, the imagery and the, the readings for Advent. And Anyway, point being, I like Advent is, is my point here. Uh, so please join us for any or all of these things. And in the meanwhile, good night from Ginger Snap and me. Until next time. <laughs> Do not bite my earring.